All right, so today we're going to be going over a MacBook Pro Retina that is not sleeping when you close the lid after a liquid spill. We're going to go through how you would troubleshoot something like this. And um, I got lucky here, but we're also going to go over some of my frustration with Apple. I know, surprise fucking su uh, surprise that I have something bad to say about Apple on this channel. So one of the things that you should understand is that there is a signal called SMC underscore lid. When this signal is asserted, Okay, to, you know, I actually, actually should have looked this up before I did this. I honestly don't even remember. I think the way that this works is when this, the, lid, the signal is high, it thinks that the screen is not closed. And, well, not closed. And when the signal is low, it thinks the screen is closed. Or the other way around. To be honest with you, I don't even remember because I have this problem very, very rarely. Um, I think I can actually look this up. Let's take a look and see. So if I look this up, SMC underscore lid on an older board it'll probably tell me here here we go lid open 3.42 volts lid closed 0 0.5 volts so low the lid is closed high the lid is open so, so let's take a look at this on this schematic over here so what I do is I go through SMC lid and I try to figure out what the sleep sensor is because on these newer machines the sleep center is integrated into the motherboard itself and here we have a hall sensor, or lid sensor. It used to be called a hall sensor uh, on really, really old laptops. I'm not sure if you guys remember back that far. I know I got a lot of new young subscribers on this channel. Laptops used to have that little thing that sticks up out of it right by uh, the top of the keyboard, this little this point. And if you pressed it, it would actually put the laptop to sleep. It, was, it used to be a physical sensor before they had magnets and all that to do the job. But now they have a magnet to do the job and they have this little hall sensor. So if we go back to the schematic here, you can see it in the drawing. So this is what I'm going to guess is the hall sensor because it says hall dash sensor, which, come on now, obvious. So what's going on here is SMC underscore lid underscore R is a signal that comes from the hall sensor. And then it goes through the zero ohm resistor where it then becomes SMC lid. And SMC lid is going to go straight to the SMC. Again, big surprise there. SMC underscore lid. What do you think manages the machine knowing if it's open or closed? With the signal I named SMC underscore lid. The SMC. SMC stands for System Management Controller. Now, if we were to go over to this beautiful new board view software that somebody put together for me. Thank you so much, by the way. I really appreciate this. And uh, we look for R5250, this new board view. Let me see. Can you see what I see? Yeah, you can. You'll see that it's right over here. Now, if we go over to the microscope. All right, so I fucked up my... my um, my open broadcaster scene, so I'm overdubbing this after the fact, so I didn't notice that I wasn't recording audio. So the first thing that you're going to notice if I go to this area where SMC lit is, around where what, this thing over here, which is what I can assume the sleep sensor is, the thing that says copyright 2010, I'm assuming that's the sleep sensor, and when you zoom in, you're going to notice that it looks like there's a resistor next to that capacitor that is missing. And if you take a look, you can really see where the damage was, because right where this trace is, it's going to a probe pad that's destroyed. So I like to think of that as kind of where the lightning struck when it comes to liquid damage. So anytime I see that, I kind of think that way. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to scrape away, because you may think that there's no pad there. You may think there's no pad. Oh, my God, I can't solder to this. And as soon as you start scraping away at it, what you're going to notice is that there is actually a pad there and that there isn't any real serious problem. You can just simply scrape away. Once you've scraped away all of the corrosion, then you'll be set and you'll be able to go over it with some flux and solder and you'll have what can, you know, not really a solder pad, but you'll have something that you can use as a solder pad. Now, a lot of people in this business like to talk about things like, uh, like, like pad repair kits and I get a lot of comments saying you're not professional because you're not repairing the pad. And the reality is that the pad repair kits are, well, the first things first, pad repair kits they're really kind of for bigger devices. They're not for devices that are, you know, 0201 resistors. And when we're getting down to doing pad repair on 0201 devices, I mean, that it's just not practical for what we're doing. Again, this is not... Firstly, I would fully endorse using this method on this... You know, I would use this on a space shuttle that I was on. Seriously. But even if we're, you know, you're paranoid about that, this is not a space shuttle. It's a laptop or a cell phone. This is a totally valid way to repair because... By the time you've 
actually gone through all the effort to put a new pad there and you've gone through all that effort, you've taken away a lot of time. And keep in mind, a lot of these jobs, they got to be done in 20 to 40 minutes or else it goes in the trash. So if you're in the middle of troubleshooting, I may replace this component and it may not work. So if I replace this component in a minute and it doesn't work, that's fine. If I spend 40 minutes on it, or 20 to 30 minutes on one single component, then it kind of stops being practical. So you're gonna see what I'm gonna do here is I cleaned it off, I scraped it away with my tweezers, and now I'm just going to run soldering with flux there, and you'll see that I'm scraping because I wanna make sure that I, you know, I have a nice clean surface that I'm soldering to. And you may ask, why is it that I'm adding so much solder? That's fucking ridiculous. Well, all of that excess is going to stick to the elbow of my tip. So you're going to notice that my soldering tip here has an elbow on it. There's a T15-JS02 from Hacko. And if you notice, all, all the, the excess solder, it's not going to stay on the board. You're not going to have a clump of solder. It's all going to get sucked up onto that tip. So what I'm doing there is what the, the flux is doing, it's pretty much kind of cleaning the board. And you also have that big vat of solder where pretty much any dirt or any junk is getting sucked into that vat of solder that's going on in my tip. So what I wind up with uh, once I clean the flux away is two very clean, quote, pads, end quote, which you're going to see here. And it looks like we're getting very close to the part where I was not an idiot and I actually have audio. So since we're getting very close to that part, I can now turn this microphone off. Yay. He is back in action. I did find, I did send it to them. This was 290 bucks. That's the discounted rate. So $290 was the discounted rate to get this fucking thing back. But you know what? That's totally fine by me. I didn't get a new nozzle. My nozzle looks like shit because it keeps dropping. One thing, you know, the Hacko was a piece of crap compared to the JBC. There's no, there's no way around it. I mean, like, it, it, was, it was just much worse in many ways. But the one thing I liked about it is it didn't fall off the desk. This little stand that the JBC comes with, like, it is so easy to knock this shit off the table, it's ridiculous. Look at this. Whoops. So what happens is the nozzle of this fucking $2,000 instrument winds up falling onto the floor over and over again and getting just destroyed. I like the Hacko for having the nice side mount. So let's get started here with this. I'm going to stop bitching about the JBC. It's just one thing to think about because, again, this thing is $2,000 fucking dollars. It would be nice if this little holder over here were worth more than 10 bucks. But it feels nice. It's like it's not, it's not light. It's just the way that this is put together is just designed to leverage it in a manner where it's always going to fall off the table. And I didn't realize, you know, just how much better this was in the Hacko until, like, honestly, I mean, I knew it was better, but I didn't realize just how by leaps and bounds it was until I tried to remove an SMC with the Hacko, and six minutes in, the SMC wasn't off the board. I was able to get the thing to reflow temperature in 45 seconds with the JBC. Oh, you can't see anything, can you? All right, and we're back to the part where I had no audio because I'm a dipshit that forgot how to use Open Broadcaster. So what I'm doing here is I'm also going to remove that capacitor on the left. The capacitor itself is probably fine. That's cosmetic damage. It's a little bit of wear and tear. To be honest, if they don't wind up, you know, spilling something again, that cap probably could have been reused. This is just me having a bit of OCD. And, um, yeah, but that's, we're going to replace that. And same general procedure. Too much flux, as always. Now keep in mind that probe point on the bottom that is destroyed, it doesn't actually matter. That part where the trace is going to, that's a test point. That's not actually going to anything. So if you look in the schematic, SMC lid is going to, SMC lid R is going to go from the resistor to the other side of the resistor, where it then becomes SMC lid. That then goes to the capacitor, and from that capacitor it actually goes to the SMC. But it's, I don't, I am pretty sure it's not going to the SMC through that. That, 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 uh, that I could be wrong. I could be on some bullshit. Actually, no, I don't think I'm on some bullshit because why would the signal before the resistor go to the SMC? Yeah, so that, that, that probe point is pretty much worthless. It's used. Camcorder. Okay, watch. See this? Focus, not focus. Focus, not focus. These really small differences, these really small differences in board height will affect it. Whereas when you have the foc when you have it zoomed out like this at, like, let's say, 7x, it doesn't make a difference. You see that? So when people ask me why is it that I'm okay with the microscope that only has the 10 and the 40x or the 10 and the 30x or the lower zoom, the thing is is that the lower zoom itself is actually really easy to work with. Whereas again, when you zoom in, and this is just 20x right here, this isn't even 40 or 50 or 90 or any of that crazy shit. 
as soon as you touch the board or you move it a little bit, you're out of focus and it really makes you dizzy. So one of the things I talk about on this channel is making it easy for yourself to do this work over long periods of time and how to be efficient and how to be good at this if you're only a one person's shop like I am doing all these repairs. And one of the ways that I keep my eyes from getting tired and my head from getting too tired is I keep myself zoomed out. So I don't, you know, I don't buy into this bullshit that, you know, the only way to do this uh, with, with ultra accuracy is to, you know, be in a dick waving contest about the zoom level and zoom all the way in. That's not, you know, more zoom is not necessarily better. It just, in my opinion, more zoom just gives you more of a fucking headache. And you, also, that's not soldered on there. I know it's not. All right, so we're back here and you can see the capacitor is not properly soldered on the board and I don't care. The reason I don't care is because there is still ample amounts of flux on the board and when I have to solder the resistor in place that's next to it, that's solder with two Ds, S-O-D-D-E-R, thank you, uh, dictionary.com for pointing that out to me, but when you see, you're going to see once I solder the resistor that the surface tension is going to ensure that that capacitor flows right into place. Now keep in mind that that's not something that can happen unless you have flux present. The reason reason that you cannot solder something and then continue to add heat without adding new solder or new flux is that there's usually flux inside of the solder that you're using. So if you just simply, uh, if, if you just simply keep adding you know, heat without adding new solder with flux in it or flux on the board, you're going to notice that your joints come out all crappy. They look like these little Hershey's kisses. If so if you're kind of wondering why the ends of your solder joints don't look like the factory and they have all these little spikes sticking up out of them, it's mostly likely because you ran out of flux. Okay, since there's no audio from the original video at this point, I don't know what the hell it was I was doing. Wow, why are you, why are you just showing us a picture of the fucking board in the microscope, asshole? What were you doing? Were you helping a customer? Were you taking a piss? Were you just, ah. Jack, the, the idiot moved something, so I think he's, he's finally about to get back to work. Come on now, don't make me have to edit shit. I hate editing. You know, the thing is, I actually like doing YouTube videos. I genuinely enjoy it, but I fucking hate editing. I've just kind of gotten to this point where I don't want to listen to myself talk. I don't want to see myself work. The, 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 the worst punishment that you could give me at the end of a day is to make me sit through hours of my own repairs fucking editing videos. And it's just like stupid shit that I wind up editing. It's, you know, like it's me going to the bathroom, me helping a customer, somebody calling and cursing, or, you know, it's just, it's just stupid shit like that that I know I have to edit because, again, I have a wireless microphone. There's really no reason for you to hear me in the bathroom. But anyway, here's, here's the money shot. You're going to see that everything flows right into place, and it's not going to go out of focus because I'm only at 7x. See that? It's called surface tension. Everything just flows right into place. Bam. And the flux is heated away. So I wait until the flux is kind of heated away to put the hot air really close. And when I put the hot air really close, it just flows. And now we're on to the next video clip. Okay, so here I'm going to hold up the machine and you see a question mark folder, right? So now I'm going to take my magnets that I'm using to hold all the screws over here. And when I put it right where the hole sensor should be, it turns off. Now I do this and it's back. But I put it over here, it turns off which means that we fixed the problem with the hall sensor. Now, here we had the opposite of what the usual problem is. So I figure I should tell you at the very least what the usual problem is. Usually the issue is not that the computer never goes to sleep. Rather, the issue is that there's a broken capacitor or a broken hall sensor that's keeping the SMC lid signal low at zero volts. And what this will cause is random freezing, randomly not waking from sleep, or no backlight, because keep in mind that the screen itself is not going to be on if it thinks the lid is closed. So these are some of the issues where people will search for the backlight circuit, they'll search power circuits, they'll search all different things, but they won't look at the SMC lid signal. And the reason the SMC lid signal is important is because, again, all these other problems and all these other parts of the machine can be caused by the SMC lid signal being low. So it's something to look at, something to think about, and also, again, this is one of those things that people try to fix with the whole heat gunning in the oven thing. If that capacitor is short in the ground, so let's just go over this again. SMC lid. I know some of the new subscribers are going to think I'm picking on Linus here. I'm really not trying to pick on him when I say oven. I've been talking about this oven thing on this channel for years because it's a very, very common practice in our industry. It's been a practice long before Linus even had a channel. So I'm not trying to snark on Linus here because every, every time I mention the word oven now, I realize that people are like 
mentioning him and okay yes i did a douchey video on him talking about ovens but that was one time only and he and we talked about it and he's honestly a nice guy that actually cares about people doing stuff the right way for the most part you know so i'm not talking about him but what i'm talking about here is see these capacitors over here sometimes if these capacitors are screwed up they'll actually work again with heat so let's say this capacitor is short in the ground or something right you can actually kind of temporarily stop that from happening by heating it so let's say this is short in the ground it's going to make the computer think that the lid is closed when it's not closed it's just one of those things that i want you to be aware of because again I see it all the time, especially with new students that come here. They start checking the backlight circuit, the power circuit, the CPU V core circuit. They check all these different things when instead of just checking, like, does the computer think that it's sleeping? If the computer thinks it's sleeping, it's not going to work regardless of whether everything else is in good condition. It's a very common defect, and it's something that I think you should look for. Now, the reason that I'm pissed off with this one is because... Uh, there's no schematic for it, so I'm actually using the schematic for an older motherboard and just hoping that nothing changed. Again, if something changed in this design, for all I know, I put the wrong shit on this machine. <laughs> I'm using a schematic for a 2013 Haswell on a 2015-16 machine because I can't get the schematic to this fucking board. Now, luckily, common sense, just looking at the circuit, looking at how simple it is, looking at how it works, I know that nothing actually changed. But what if everything changed? What if everything had changed altogether? It was completely different. I'd never solve this. I still don't have a schematic for this machine, and that sucks, but that is Apple, and that is what I deal with in order to do my job. That's it for today, and as always, I hope you learned something.